in the last two months, the Indian national security scenario has undergone a sudden and devastating shift of paradigm. This has created an extremely dangerous situation for India in the regional neighborhood. Previously, we had the threat from the China-Pakistan axis and a third front of the Maoists and the radical, jihadi radical, Islamist radicals within the country. Those were the third front. So we had China, we had Pakistan, and then we had this third front. We now have a fourth front opening in Afghanistan. The jihadis have won a sudden and unexpected victory there because a sudden loss of uh, the American, uh, dissolving of the American military resolve. This has resulted in a very bad optics of a military disgrace almost in terms of the way the Americans have withdrawn in sheer panic and sheer disarray from Afghanistan. So let us first take a look at what exactly has happened. You see, for from the last two years, the United States is, you know, come to realize that it must end its forever wars in, uh, you know, Afghanistan, in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, etc. Uh, because they feel that the American presence on the ground, boots on the ground, draws the Islamist jihadi ire, directs it all towards uh, the United States, all the angst towards the West. Now, the thing that we must understand is that previously, the Middle East was vital to the United States for the energy security scenario. For quite some time now, America has become surplus in its own energy resources thanks, thanks to, you know, fracking and uh, the, you know, other sources of energy that they have found within their own borders. America is now energy surplus. It just doesn't need the Middle East. So, why should the Americans continue with their presence there? That is their logic. Afghanistan also had correlations with, at one time, the Eurocall wanted to get out oil from Central Asia. They don't need that oil any longer. They are oil surplus. So, what the Americans are trying to do, what the CIA design is, is to reduce the American visible footprints in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, and therefore, obviate the ire, obviate the anger of the jihadi tanzims, the Middle East uh, radical Muslim population, the very radical Muslim population in Afghanistan, especially the Taliban and its cohorts. So they want to divert, listen to this carefully, they want to divert the Islamist angst, the jihadi angst against uh, China, against Russia, against Iran, Central Asian states and India. So, quite obviously, they feel that there are, they are 8 to 10,000 kilometers away. And as such, you know, if they have no visible presence on the ground, they provide no uh, visible provocations by military presence, boots on the ground in Afghanistan, in the Middle East. You know, then the angst of the jihadis towards the United States will be greatly lessened. And since these are people who must fight somebody, they have nothing else to do. You know, they, their ire will be directed against uh, China, especially in Xinjiang and to support the Uyghur Muslims and in Central Asia and via Central Asia to the Caucasus and Russia. Uh, the Sunni rise of the Taliban will also affect. They've already started killing the Hazaras, demolishing the statues of Hazara leaders. So to that extent, Iran will be impacted. The biggest impact will come on India. Please understand that in the Islamist imagination, you know, Kashmir comes second only to the Palestine. For the jihadi community, you know, Kashmir comes only to the uh, issue of Palestine and Israel. 
So a lot of the Islamist ire, the ISI is very specifically planning to direct it against India, against Kashmir and to that extent our security scenario has just become far more complex than it ever was. We had the joint threat from the China-Pakistan axis, we had the third front of the Maoists, we had the uh, internal front of the radicalism, jihadi radicalism in India, you know, in uh, not only in Kashmir but also, uh, you know, rearing its heads in uh, UP, in Bengal, in, uh, in Kerala. So we had these threats already to cater for, now you are adding a fourth front of Afghanistan. Now my simple plea is, your security situation has never been more dangerous. So what do you do about it? The basic options being discussed today are whether we recognize the Taliban, we deal with the realities on the ground or otherwise. My humble submission is that you can do all that you want to cultivate the Taliban. But if you think you can change the jihadi mindset of such fanatical organizations with your engagement, I am afraid you will be throwing good money after bad and you will be creating more problems for yourself. Whatever you give to them will be used against you because the Taliban is more beholden to the ISI in Pakistan. They sustained Osama bin Laden in uh, Abbottabad. They sustained the top Taliban leadership in Pakistan. They have invested heavily in the Taliban. For you to think that now you can invest more than Pakistan in the Taliban, I mean it is self-contradictory and it is living in Alice in Wonderland. This is uh, imbecilic optimism, uh, optimistic drivel as Uncle Eshwara Iyer has said, to uh, expect that the Taliban, the leopard will change its spot and suddenly become very friendly towards India. Please understand one thing very clearly. Afghanistan is a rentier state. Now what is a rentier state? A rentier state as Barnett Rubin, one of the foremost scholars on Afghanistan had defined, is a state that is is a state that is lacks the resources for nation state formation within its own territory. Resources for nation state formation in Afghanistan have always come from outside. Whether it was the loot from the neighboring countries previously in the time of Ahmed Shah Abdali and the others who looted the caravans of, uh, you know, Nadir Shah as they were passing through Afghanistan and got the resources, financial uh, muscle to raise an army of Afghan. The, thereafter, resources have come from external powers. Great Britain during the Great Game period, then the Soviet Union during the 79 to 89 period, and then United States of America and Saudi Arabia. The Mukhabarat, they laid I mean, the money on the table for Afghanistan. Now, Pakistan is left on its own, you know, and it will have to invest 8 to 10 billion dollars a year minimum just to give the pays to the doctors, nurses, school teachers, college professors, etc., 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 not to mention an Afghan army and other governmental services. The Taliban expertise is in beating up women, blowing up IDs to kill civilians, women and children mostly. The Taliban expertise is in guerrilla warfare in defense of their own territory. They are not a regular army. They can never be. The Afghan makes, does not lend himself to barrack room discipline and to forming armies, standing armies which can conduct regular operations. They can only conduct irreg irregular operations, conduct asymmetric warfare. The Taliban is an insurgent organization. It has no experience in governance. The only experience it has is enforcing a very archaic version, a very misplaced version of Sharia law where women are beaten. It is a misogynist version, medievalist version. 
it does not conform to the imperatives of nation state formation in the 21st century. It cannot, it lacks the expertise to govern Afghanistan. It has caused a brain drain by pushing out every single educated Afghan because they just want to get out. The educated Afghans who could run the nation state, who could run the airports, the colleges, schools, hospitals, government offices, banks, etc. have all been driven out in the most massive brain drain in recent history. Lakhs and lakhs of them have had to just flee Afghanistan. So how will they really form a nation state? The Taliban hopes that it will get international recognition, it will gain legitimacy. And when it gains legitimacy, it will get the foreign funding which can sustain a state in Afghanistan. If India, you know, rushes forth to recognize the Taliban regime, we will be giving it just the precise legitimacy and recognition that it is so desperately seeking as a rentier state. It knows it cannot survive without running, without getting foreign funding. So it is desperate. Now it is on its best behavior. But you can trust the ISI to try and encourage the Taliban to crack down viciously on the Afghan population the moment that Taliban government is in place and now all the American troops are out. So their need to you know, put on their best behavior is not, is not so compelling. Now, Pakistan's standard recipe is a crackdown, a military crackdown. They had does, done precisely that in Bangladesh, where they had killed 3 million Bengalis, raped a million Bengali women and pushed out 10 million into India as refugees. But the Pakistan ISI will try and uh, you know, uh, encourage the Taliban to do that to gain a modicum of control to terrorize the Afghan population. Now, there are certain problems coming their way. Afghanistan is facing an acute drought, especially in the eastern parts of Afghanistan. It is facing an acute crisis. It is facing an acute economic distress. It is facing food shortages. And it is, you know, it is likely to face a major humanitarian disaster in the coming months. Now, with the Taliban in charge fully, and they haven't formed an inclusive government as yet, and there doesn't seem any hope in hell of an inclusive government. They have imposed, they have defied the will of the United Nations. The United States has now ceased to matter. You know, so therefore the fact of the matter is that Afghanistan is in serious, you know, economic problems. The Pakistanis have no resources to help Afghanistan economically. Pakistan itself is a basket case. Pakistan got about 5.5 uh, $5 billion dollars from the IMF on American intervention just to help it negotiate a deal with the Taliban. It used that money to buy up the Afghan army units and formations. It has used up that money in that. It just purchased them. That is the standard Afghanistan practice. You purchase the opposing side. That was done in 1996. And uh, the ISI has just repeated more of the same. Please read, uh, you know, Clark's very, very perceptive article in the CBS News. Very perceptive article that... Once again, the ISI has gone on a checkbook campaign to purchase the opposition. The one opposition they are not likely to be able to purchase is the Tajiks of the Panjshir Valley. Now, people may feel that, you know, that is surrounded on all sides by the uh, Taliban, you know, and uh, the Taliban will overrun the Panjshir Valley. As a military analyst, I am deeply skeptical of the Talibani capabilities to take the Panjshir Valley. Don't forget that in the Soviet occupation period, seven major operations had been launched by the Russians against the Panjshir Valley. In the seventh Panjshir operation, which was launched by <coughs> one regiment each, from the 103rd, 104th, 105th Guards Airborne Divisions, 
the best troops of the Soviet Union. The elite troops of the Soviet Union, along with a motorized rifle division, along with the 38 Afghan commando brigade and about 6 to 10,000 Afghan soldiers, a 30,000 size operation, core size operation, had been preceded by carpet bombing by Tupolev bombers, you know, by their the, the Su 24 uh, frog foot, you know, their fighter bombers. They had used the Grad multi-barrel rockets in abundance. They had used their hind helicopters, attack helicopters to try and, you know, winkle Ahmad Shah Masood's Tajiks out of the uh, Panjshir Valley. They failed and ultimately they had to have a truce with Ahmad Shah Masood where the KGB paid him huge amounts of money to stay out of the fighting. Not to surrender, to stay out of the fighting. And he did because, you know, the pressure he was also facing was quite tremendous. But he had faced it off successfully. The Taliban has no experience in set-piece operations. Quite obviously, they will use Pakistani soldiers in civilian clothes to try and, uh, you know, shake the Tajiks out of the Panjshir Valley. Even the Pakistani army is not very good at high altitude operations like we have seen their capabilities in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Kargil. They would require heavy air support and fire support, which I don't think the world will allow such a blatant intervention by Pakistan. And if it does, it will give India also an excuse to try and then intervene. And we should intervene. So I see the Tajik population in the Panjshir Valley under Ahmad Shah Masood's son. And now, of course, there is a legitimacy to this. The Vice President, Amarullah Saleh, is now in the Panjshir Valley. And he has said that he is the acting president. Legally, he is absolutely right. You know, the, the, in terms of legitimacy, the legitimacy is with Abdullah Saleh, the only elected government. Who has elected the Taliban? They haven't even held a tribal shura. Nothing. They have just militarily imposed themselves, imposed their will on the whole of Afghanistan with the help of Pakistan. About 10 to 15,000 Pakistani fighters have come in. Most of them are their soldiers. All the tanks, even in 1996, were being operated by Pakistan. Artillery was being operated by Pakistan. Air power resources were all operated by Pakistan. Joe Biden has now gifted $85 billion worth of equipment to the Taliban. This includes 200 aircraft, about 50 plus B-17s, 50 plus of these uh, American helicopters. They have got these Cessna style uh, turboprop fighter aircraft. They have got uh, other kind of helicopters, Black Hawks, about 56 Black Hawks, etc. 200 aircraft, 600,000 assault rifles. And of course, 75,000 vehicles, Humvees and uh, armored vehicles and the others. Yeah, 85,000 is more than the defense budget of India and Russia. All this will now go to the ISI and the ISI will try and use it. My point is very simple. The problem in Afghanistan is the Pakistan army and the ISI. To put pressure on the Pakistan army, there is no need for India to get into Afghanistan and put boots on the ground. You just have the western border, our western border, which is the eastern border of Pakistan. You can apply pressure from the line of control down to the run of Kutch. And if we have any sense, we will try and fight forward. We cannot let the Panipat syndrome take over. That means we wait for the enemy to come to Panipat 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers from Delhi before we give battle. History tells you that you lost all three battles of Panipat because it is too late. And the fighting takes place on Indian soil, damage to the Indian population, Indian infrastructure. What nonsense is this? This defensive mindset is extremely dangerous. We will have to fight forward. We will have to fight forward in Afghanistan. Now, how do we fight forward? One, by strategic disruption. What is the opposition to the Taliban in Afghanistan? 
right now it is one the tajiks the uzbeks will at a point in time certainly join them the isi has tried to buy them off qureshi saab held a conference of all the former northern alliance people i'm sure they must have been offered huge sums of money uh, but the tajiks of panshir are already fighting Pakistan, to my uh, my assessment, will not be able to take over Panjshir because of the terrain difficulty of the terrain quotient. The friction value of the terrain is enormous. If the Russians could not take it, I don't find the Taliban any superior. Despite all the propaganda by Pakistan and the United States that they are ten feet tall, they are not. You see them in set piece fighting. You see the way they have bloodied their nose just in the initial skirmishes. so it will it is likely to hold out unless we weaken india weakens tajikistan weakens russia weakens the, even the russians have a imperative to fight forward to get a buffer between themselves and the taliban the russians at a point in time they are already holding exercises in tajikistan uzbekistan etc we we will also have to ensure that this resistance is not allowed to die out it will be the most stupid thing on india's part to try and desert the tajiks i mean the americans have shown they are absolutely unreliable india can't afford that the americans are 8000 kilometers away from afghanistan india is just next door how can you be unreliable with your former friends you will have to do something and uh, we will have to see what we can do to the extent that we can do we have a base in tajikistan we have an air base etc so the feasibility of doing it is pretty strong what we need is the political will to do it i'm very sorry to see this political will is under severe attack and from our own former diplomats community who say let us suck up to the taliban are it is one thing to have you know to deal with the taliban after all you have no bloody option if they are there they are there they take some hostage they take some hostage you have to deal with them like you had to deal in the kandahar hijack but that is one thing giving recognition and legitimacy to the taliban is absolutely another and i would say it should be a strict no no everything depends on the events in the next 6 months fools rush in where angels fear to tread there is no need for us to rush in and say let's get the first mover advantage let us be the first in the world to recognize the taliban the taliban is a monstrous medievalist misogynist jihadist entity which will forever be opposed to you will hate you and will try and do their best whatever sweet talk they do will do their best to harm india and her interest they will do their best to wage to wage ghazwai hind the unfinished battle for the conquest of uh, hindustan with this uh, reality i mean we have to be very very cautious before we try and legitimize the taliban that will be throwing in the towel the whole world may recognize the taliban why should we does it suit our interest and like i keep saying india is not the 51st state of the united states if the united states has cut and run in a manner which is a military disgrace well they've got their strategy they are looking after their own interest they could be least concerned about indian interests or iranian interest or russian or chinese interest in fact their entire effort is to is to direct jihadi angst islamist angst against china against russia against iran against central asia and india the democratic dispensation is showing the amount of uh, friendliness with pakistan is amazing they are quite prepared to dump india and to uh, create problems for india this has been very disconcerting what what talk of the quad if this is the way our friends are going to behave gift 85 billion dollars to the taliban who do you think it will be used against in the 1950s america had given huge amount of patent tanks and f86 sabers and f104 star fighters to pakistan to give it a military advantage over india we had said then that it will be used against india they said no it's against the soviet union like hell it was used against the soviet union it was definitely used against india in the 1965 war in the 71 war 
now pakistan is relying upon china to fund and bankroll the taliban regime the chinese are not fools they have also seen the kind of collaboration that is clearly visible between the united states and the taliban the cia has had 2 to 3 years last to cultivate the taliban they have more funds than anybody else and quite obviously the chinese will have to worry whether the americans have purchased whole factions of the taliban over and they are going to use them one of the reasons for that withdrawal is to direct the taliban and the uh, you know islamic is khorasan and the al qaeda etc against china so that they have no energies left to deal with america and europe that was the american calculation in two, uh, you know in 1996 when it failed dismally and unfortunately there was the biggest blowback in intelligence history in the world when the same taliban uh, when the same afghan mujahideen they had raised the same osama bin laden hit the made the biggest hit against the united states the bodyguard of osama bin laden is now back in kandahar the al qaeda has family ties marriage ties with the taliban for the americans to say that they will dump the taliban and the other jihadi outfits is khorasan etc i mean it is it is not even an optical illusion it is a delusion and anybody who is you know believes this optimistic drivel will soon be disabused it is extremely dangerous it is extremely dangerous there was a blowback before the mujahideen they had raised against the soviet union hit the united states the blowback could occur well again however much money you throw at the taliban ultimately it is their deepest ideological convictions their 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 uh, you know uh, their their islamist certitudes you know their very very uh, set uh, jihadi mindsets will lead them to treat america as the great satan america is trying to uh, reduce that hostility by trying to get out of by trying to get out of middle east by trying to get out of afghanistan end the forever war end the visible provocations by having uh, white troops inside afghanistan having uh, white troops inside the middle east they are trying to get out and deal with them with an over the horizon uh, ability i am very sorry that over the horizon ability lacks the punch we saw despite all taliban assurances how they had told america they had given signed an agreement that afghan soil would not be allowed to be used against america and its allies that by the way excludes india india is not supposed to be an ally of the united states strategic partnership partnership is all very good america doesn't deal uh, uh, consider you an ally and the present democratic dispensation has said so clearly to your face you are not allies so that means america has taken no undertaking that the taliban and its cohorts will not attack india right but the fact is the taliban has already double crossed the taliban with the pakistani isi has already double crossed the americans what was the terrorist attack on the kabul airport on 26 august was it not an attack on the united states 13 us marines were killed 18 were wounded and 180 afghans were killed this is one of the biggest terror strike in recent history and it has been done from afghan soil against the american uh, troops who were there so what guarantee is there that they will not again the is khorasan will not again attack the united states the al qaeda will not again attack the uh, united states and take revenge for osama bin laden take revenge for osama bin laden and the taliban will say we did not do it it is the is khorasan and then the americans will launch a drone strike kill with the first drone strike against the is khorasan they kill two with the second uh, you know strike they killed uh, one more but they killed a lot of uh, women and children around so i with with no presence on the ground with no ground intelligence even the cia director has said this will be of extremely limited values 
So, the simple cost uh, fact is the Americans to cut their economic costs, they say they want to focus against China. I am not very sure. The global perception is that if you, the American forces now cannot stand up to a ragtag outfit like the Taliban, how will they take on the Russian Chinese combined together? <coughs> How will they be able to take the Russian and the Chinese military combined together? By the way, Joe Biden had tasked his intelligence agencies to find out if China was responsible for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. They have turned around and now told uh, you know, Joe Biden that we have no ability to find out. We will need to cooperate with China. So much about Joe Biden's capability or willingness to risk a conflict with China. So, he is not going to fight China, he is not going to fight, uh, <laughs> you know, Russians, if you can't fight the Taliban. I mean, it is difficult to now assume that they, they will fight the Russians and the Chinese together. They will deal with them with asymmetric wars. That is their plan. The American plan is to try and turn Islamist angst against China, against the Russians and against the regional powers, keep everybody busy and preoccupied including India. So, we must now come to certain conclusions. Number one, you are entirely alone. If you expect the Americans to pull your chestnuts out of the fire, they are not doing it. To the contrary, they will tell you to help Pakistan. So, we have to stand up on our own two feet now. The good news is that India has a population of nearly 1.4 billion, one of the youngest population. We have the second largest army, we have the fourth largest air force, we have the fifth largest navy. So, we are capable of taking care of ourselves, providing our political will, will to fight, will to conflict does not weaken. We cannot afford to be lax or lose. Otherwise, you will invite a civilizational disaster. You have the jihadi cohorts outside in uh, Afghanistan, in the Middle East. They are planning to turn the whole of Central Asia into an Islamic bastion. The greater threat so far was from China. An equal magnitude threat is now coming from Islamist jihadism. Ably funded and uh, fanned by Pakistan, Turkey and the rest of them. There is a wave of this jihadi triumphalism now sweeping the whole Islamic world and America has just made them feel 10 feet tall without a real fight, without a real military victory. You decide to cut and run, the other side becomes 10 feet tall. Everybody is enthused by the success of the Taliban, all the jihadi factions, including in India. So, the American strategy very clearly now is to remove visible provocations by putting feet on the ground. They have removed the feet on the ground from Afghanistan. They are going to shortly do it from the Middle East under the pretext of stopping their forever wars. Uh, for whatever uh, little chastisement ability they want, they will depend on their over the horizon capabilities, their drones for specific kills and then their, uh, you know, massive attacks if they need to do. They have their B-52s, they have their carrier bone air power which can intervene. They would like to, their cruise missiles which can intervene, but they would like to keep an over the horizon presence which does not give a provocation to the uh, jihadis. And the angst of the jihadis can therefore be turned against China, it can be turned against uh, Russia, Central Asian states, Iran and India, not necessarily in that order. In the Islamist imagination, Kashmir comes only second to Palestine. So, one of the biggest focus of the jihadis now based in Afghanistan under ISI prodding and uh, encouragement and inducement will be now to turn against India and try and win the jihad in Kashmir. So, what do we do? Number one, strategic disruption. We ensure that we prevail upon the world not to support this lunatic regime. One, we wait the next six months for the economic realities to bite home. That means the food crisis, the economic crisis will turn the people of Afghanistan solidly against the Taliban 
we just i mean it is just a matter of time taliban is now governing and if they can't pay their people if they can't give food to their people if there's runaway inflation and now the cruelties will start under isi instigation the beatings of women will start whipping of women stoning of women uh, you know bashing up of people killing of uh, you know adversaries killing of minorities ethnicities it's all going to start in a big way so just wait the urban population of afghanistan which is quite considerable now will also turn against the taliban the minorities will turn against taliban which is almost 50% of the afghan population the tajiks the uzbeks the hazaras the ismailis etc and when that happens if they turn against the shias well iran is once more into the conflict russia is once more into the conflict tajikistan is once more into the conflict and Uh, there'll be a totally transformed scenario. The situation in Afghanistan has always been prone to sudden, non-linear changes. What does India do? Strategic disruption. We will have to support the resistance to the Taliban. Otherwise, we can forget about any influence in that area. We will be seen as unreliable, if not more unreliable than the Americans. there was fond hope in afghanistan that india would intervene well second factor far more important we are in serious situation from the national security point of view we cannot look for friends and allies all of them have their own national security compulsions their own national interest to follow they are not likely to give them any precedence over indian national interest at a point in time russia and iran may turn around and find the taliban too much of a bother and then it will change the scenario substantially but as of now you are on your own and to that extent and this is the crux of my message please as a military analyst it is my duty to warn the indian nation state that you are on your own you will have to be really atmanirbhar in your military capacities and because your threats are enhanced you will have to increase your military capacities this is not the time to pinch pennies you will have to expand the armed forces not reduce them downsize them as we are doing you need more manpower you need more over the horizon capabilities you cannot pinch pennies you cannot create organizational turbulence at this stage by doing major changes in organization this is not the time this is the most serious threat that you have faced ever in your existence in your national existence you have to rise to the occasion and all this penny pinching on defense defense is the only place where we can't spend i'm sorry that will have to change you'll have to spend it and you'll have to spend it fast to create atmanirbhar autarkic capabilities to deal with the situations that have deal with the transformed scenario you need to expand your armed forces not downsize them you need to expand your capabilities you will have to spend you need to create over the horizon capabilities such as bombers where will you do mid air refueling if you have to get to afghanistan it is utter nonsense you have to buy bombers the russians were willing to give you tupole bombers and other bombers in 19 before 71 war we said for some you know very peaceful we are a very peaceful country we don't threaten others though we don't want bombers and then you used an 12 transport aircraft to bomb the pakistani forces in chamb this is utter nonsense you will have to go in for bombers one it will add another element to your strategic nuclear deterrence bombers armed with cruise missile which will have to take the detour fly over iran fly over central asia to attack the targets if required in afghanistan you have to have the capability india by the way and i was in the military operations directorate when that happened sent 20000 troops to sira loan what national interest did we have there nothing we sent it under the un flag and let me tell you the indian armed forces are very happy to go to 
uh, under the UN flag because you they get better money. The boys get better money and why not? So, we had sent 10,000 troops to Sudan, 20,000 troops to Sierra Leone. If we get a chance to do it under the UN flag, ever there is a need felt for a safe zone in uh, Kabul, in Panjshir or wherever, we must send our troops. We must create additional forces. Right now, the forces that you have are barely sufficient to deal with a two-front threat from China and Pakistan. You want to create capabilities for intervention in Afghanistan. You have to add more forces. One to do out-of-area contingency divisions will have to be raised. Air assault divisions will have to be raised. You may, uh, one marine division may have to be raised. There is Baluchistan, there is other. You cannot afford to fight defensively. You will have to be able to fight forward and not repeat the Panipat syndrome. We will fight them only and only if they cross our border. Sir, it would be too late and it would be disastrous. You need beyond visual range missiles. When the Balakot strikes happened and Pakistan retaliated, we had the spectacle of poor, uh, you know, uh, Abhinandat, very brave boy, trying to do a dogfight in a beyond visual range era. So what was the result? Despite his bravery, he still managed to shoot down an F-16, but he was down. Because the F-16 had an 80 kilometer range beyond visual range air-to-air -air missile to your 30 kilometer range missile. How can that function, sir? You can't, you may find the uh, dogfight era very romantic. You can't go back to the dogfight era. You have to fight forward. Drone warfare. You have to invest heavily in drones. 10 to 12 of them will not be sufficient now. Look at what China is doing. What China is giving to Pakistan, look at what Turkey is doing, giving to Pakistan. With the use of drones alone, they beat uh, Armenia in the Azerbaijan-Armenia war. So, drone capability, beyond visual range air combat capability, enhancing the size of the air force, enhancing the size of the army by at least two divisions of intervention forces if required. Unless you have the capability, where is the option? Everybody in this country tells us, uh, Afghanistan, we have no contiguous borders, we can do nothing. I mean, that is the most, you, I, I hope you remember your history. Expeditionary forces from India fought in World War I and World War II. Expeditionary forces worth 1.3 billion and 2.5 billion. You can't fight in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, it is so simple. To really put pressure on the Pakistan army, even if you don't go to Afghanistan, you just use over the horizon capabilities in Afghanistan. There is enough area to put pressure on Pakistan from line of control to the run of Kutch. But this defeatist attitude, the only option is to suck up to the Taliban, put garlands on their uh, necks and congratulate the ISI and Pakistan on a victory, give Pakistan a ceasefire so that it has a free hand to deal with Afghanistan as it wishes. So whose interest are we serving? Is this the correct time to give a ceasefire to Pakistan? So tell Pakistan you have a free hand. Please do whatever you want in Afghanistan. We trust you will do the best by us. <laughs> I mean, I am actually shocked and horrified. And I think this is a civilizational wake-up call. Do you want another Indian holocaust like happened between the uh, 7th and uh, 14th centuries? Do you want another Indian holocaust? About more than 100 million Indians were killed, slaughtered at that time by these foreign invasions because we wanted to fight Defensively, we will fight only if he comes to Patna, not even Panipat. So, we now have to fight forward to see that our country is not devastated by the wars that we are forced to fight on our soil. 80,000 Indians have been killed in Pakistan's asymmetric warfare since 1980 when it started in the Punjab, then went to JNK and then spread all over the country. 
how many more indians are we willing to lose because of our gandhian faith because of our uh, ahimsa tradition this is extremely dangerous situation for india don't pinch pennies you will imperil the indian nation state if you don't spend the amount that you are now required to spend we will have to put guns over butter now because it is a dire situation that we are in we can overcome and we will overcome providing we create the capabilities to fight and not just hand it over to our ambassadors ki they they are the ones who will win the war by debating by talks by debates in the united nations i'm sorry that will not help when you have to fight you have to fight fighting is best done by soldiers give them the wherewithal that they need to fight and protect this country jai hind